So this is joint work with Jonas and she and uh, David Storo, or both at Cornell, and Tony Ma from Princeton. So, so let me define the uh, tensor termization first. So uh, we are given tensor of the, the following form. Right? It is a uh, rank. Uh, it is sum of uh, any rank one tensor, and plus a noise tensor. So, um, so each rank one tensor we are, we are in the symmetric case. So each rank one tensor is just uh, uh, some vector a i to the tensor power three. So these AIs are in D dimension, and our goal is to find uh, AIs. Uh, so N is usually called the rank of the tensor, and uh, for some for some historical reason, I guess um, if uh, N is larger than D, then uh, it is called over complete tensor decomposition. Um, and, and this is also the regime that we are going to focus on. And uh, and I guess in most of the talk, we can think of the noise as zero, although our algorithm, because it's sum of source algorithm, it automatically tolerates a large amount of noise. And um, but uh, for simplicity, let's, let's think about e to be zero. Although um, because it's also already challenging when e is zero. All right. So this is the definition of the problem. So let me um, discuss a little bit uh, the motivation um, why we care about this problem. So I think the main motivation, at least in machine learning, is that uh, recent uh, in recent uh, for five years, people realized that um, we can use. Um, 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 tensor decomposition plus moment methods uh, to solve a bunch of uh, unsupervised learning problems, including mix of Gaussians, um, hidden Markov model, topic modeling, community detection, so and so forth. So let me demonstrate the idea using mix of Gaussian. So actually, this dates back to uh, 1894. Uh, this famous uh, statistician um, Carl Person. So he tried to uh, use mix of Gaussians to analyze uh, some biological or evolutional data. And he proposed this idea of moment methods. So let's um, suppose that we have a, a mixture of three Gaussians. So they have unknown mean, mu1, mu2, and mu3, and covariance matrix identity. Although in this picture, they are not identity. Uh, I couldn't find the one with the uh, identity um, online. So, um, so I know our goal is to recover. So we are given samples from this distribution, and our goal is to recover mu1, mu2, and mu3. So, and the moment method said, um, is it's in high dimension, it's something like, yes. Uh, sure, yeah, although the method uh, doesn't really care too much about the dimension. Um, yes, I mean, so we don't, yes, so they are, they are in high dimension, although I guess Carl Person works in probably three dimension or something like that, or even two dimension. Um, so, right, so, uh, so the, the idea is the following. So we look at, so we can estimate, always estimate the moment of a distribution pretty um, accurately with samples. So um, let's um, calculate the two moments. Right? In this specific example, the first moment is going to be the, the average of the mean. And the second moment is going to be the average of mu i, mu i transpose. And from these two moments, um, actually, uh, we couldn't determine uh, mu i, mu 2, mu 3, because there's a rotational invariant in it. So however, if you look at three moments, if you look at three moments, uh, we, we need to do a little bit calibration to subtract um, some function of the, the first moment. I just didn't write it down, it's a simple formula. So then we, we are going to get the three tensor defined by the mean. So now, uh, actually, um, there is enough information to actually identify mu1, mu2, and mu3. Uh, let's say, suppose uh, they are in like a low uh, high dimension, like in dimension three, for example. And actually what uh, Carl Person did is that he tried, he cast me this moment and he tried to solve this uh, system equation by hand. And, uh, and 100 years later, actually, we, I mean, we realized that uh, we can use, this is exactly our tensor decomposition problem, right? We have um, um, a tensor, and these AIs are actually the mu i's in this example. And uh, the, the n is the number of Gaussians that you can handle, and, uh, and e is the sampling error. Um, so because you cannot really get the, the true moment, you have to use samples to, to, get the mo uh, to estimate the moment. So uh, that's why we, uh, we want n to be as large as possible so that we can handle um, as more Gaussians as possible. And we also want the error to be as large as possible so that we only need a few number of samples. OK. So you allow an error, and you, you don't exactly find this device. Uh, right, right. So, so yes. So, so especially in this mix of Gaussian situation, yeah, actually in our, I mean, uh, in our theorem we also get, uh, only get AI up to arrow.
Uh, I mean, you, you could try higher order tensor, and the, the formula also works well. You can also get the fourth order tensor for mu one. So, but there. It depends on the dimension. It depends on the measure. So, so this is a d by d by d tensor. So you get these cube entries actually. So. You want to get like something like dimension, like uh, dimension m times. So okay, let's. And you have like uh, frequency uh, like information. So it seems. Oh, uh, let's count the dimension. Each AI is a d-dimensional vector. So there are n of them. So you get n d parameters. And uh, they are only they are totally even you only look at the third order tensor, you get d cube observations. So as long as d cube is larger than nd, you can hope to at least hope to recover them. I mean, so the, I mean, uh, 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 of course there are there are situa real situations which I'm going to talk about uh, in which uh, you cannot uh, I mean it's not even well defined. So there's a ill behaved uh, behavior sometimes, but uh, but you can hope to at least uh, estimate them. All right. Right, so I so, uh, also uh, related to um, the question. So um, uh, if you look at the higher order tensors, there's a cost, because uh, you need to estimate, uh, like for example, if you look at fourth order tensor, you, you need to estimate uh, d, d to the four entries. And that costs you more samples, usually. So that's why we, we tend to work with a, a lower order tensor instead of higher order tensor. Uh, all right, so, so in this talk, um, um, the, the the theorem that we are going to prove is the following. So we are going to decompose random three-order tensor. And uh, so let's say AIs are uniformly drawn from unisphere. And uh, we can allow n to be as large as d to the 1.5. And uh, the error is going to be an uh, inspection of less than of 1. This uh, FL of E basically just means that um, uh, you view this uh, d cube dimension, uh, d by d by d array as uh, d squared by d. And you measure the uh, operator norm. Actually, we can relax this uh, uh, a little bit, but it's not so important for this talk. So the theorem says that um, um, with high probability over the randomness of AIs, uh, our sum of squares algorithm is going to find all components of A1 up to AN, uh, A1 to AN up to error point 0.1 in polynomial time. All right. So just uh, some prior works. Uh, for the low run case, when n is less than d, so Lorgans has the, had this uh, simultaneous negotiation algorithm um, if A of 1 up to A are linearly independent. So, and uh, Goyo and Van Pala and Xiao, so they uh, analyzed the noise stability of the, uh, analyzed how much noise uh, uh, that Lorgans algorithm can tolerate. And uh, it turns out they can prove a bound which is inverse poly. The, the exponent is not actually I mean, even explicit. So, um, and Xiao and Kakeid, so they had the tensor power method for orthogonal AIs. So if the, the component are really just completely orthogonal. And the to noise tolerance is 1 over any spectral norm noise. Um, what is the more interesting? The, the low run case? The, the high run case certainly right, is more interesting. Yeah. I mean, at least for now, I mean, because the low run case, we kind of almost solve it. Uh, the only missing part is that the noise tolerance is not too good. And, uh, and our main goal is to, find, to, to do the high run case. Right. Yes. But uh, in, in practice, uh, I mean, if you are in high dimensions, you have a mixture of some Gaussians, isn't it? Uh, typically, that the number of Gaussians is fewer. Yes. Yeah, so for mix of Gaussians, sure. Yes. Typically, the number of Gaussians is fewer than dimension, probably. So, but uh, there are other problems where um, so the so number of Gaussians is really just uh, some hidden representations. Um, um, so they are hidden variables. There are situations where hidden variables actually uh, of higher dimension than the uh, observed variables. And uh, for example, in dictionary learning. Yeah, so, and that's a typical application, yeah, as well. So, so, so higher order, and also like for hidden Markov model, so for many other situations, the observation is actually of low dimension, but the hidden variable of high dimension. Right, so, and, uh, right. So for over complete case, in the worst case, um, um, th most of the tensor problems are either NP hard or ill behaved. So for example, it's NP hard to compute the rank or the best rank one approximation. And uh, the rank is not even robust to perturbation in the sense that there is an example of a series of a uh, rank uh, two tensor which converges to a rank three tensor, which is kind of weird. And, uh, and the uniqueness of the conversation is also not clear. Um, Kruzko proved that uh, under some conditions, um, um, the, the uniqueness, of, so we can have uniqueness of the conversation, but, the, op but the, the condition only applies to the case when kn is less than 1.5 times d. 
And we are shooting for n is less than d to the 1.5. In the random case, uh, yeah. you were expecting. Yes, for random right. case, they are. Yes, yes. For random case, they are unique. So uh, up to some perturbation, a little bit. So and uh, the, um, there is a connection to unique game conjecture and small set expansion. So Barak, Brando, Haro, Kellner, and Star and Joe. So they show that if you have a good approximation on the injective norm of the, the tensor, uh, you can solve uh, small set expansion or unique game. And um, so this just says that um, I mean we, we shouldn't hope to have a very good uh, algorithm for for the for the very worst case. But you're not, uh, trying to compute the right, you don't have to compute the injective norm to decompose tensor yeah. I mean, a priori, right? So mm, this is just some related work, yes. And uh, uh, recent work of uh, Barak and uh, Moisa is done. Uh, that's for tensor uh, completion. It's uh, it, so that's a kind of a more statistical problem instead of. You know, I mean, only for decomposition, yes. So yeah, actually, there is another, several others. So, okay. So, um, Bahaskara and Karaka Moisha and uh, Vijay yeah, Ran Heaven. So, um, so, so, okay. So, the idea is that uh, if you have a high order tensor, usually it's easier to decompose. The, the reason is kind of very simple because if you look at the AI to the tensor power 2, so they are actually um, they are more likely to be linear independent than AIs because they are in high dimension, they are in d squared dimension, and you have only n of them. So if n is less than d squared, you can hope that they are linear independent. And uh, and uh, this paper shows that uh, under smooth analysis framework, they are indeed linear independent uh, with very good probability. And um, and therefore you can use Lorentz algorithm for the low run case on the six order tensor because you just view the six order tensor as um, the three order tensor over AI to the tensor power two. And, uh, and by Rock, Kellner, and Storo, so they show a cost polynomial time algorithm for one over epsilon order tensor. And, but the, the point here is that uh, they can prove uh, it with a very, very weak condition on the, the assumptions on AI. So it's kind of like a, there's co almost no assumption on AI. But the rank is O of D. What is one over epsilon over the tensor? So it's just AI to the tensor one over epsilon, or to the tensor power one over epsilon. No, yes, yes. So, so higher order tensor is usually easier. And uh, for, for random three tensor, uh, I think the closest um, uh, um, paper, uh, so one of them is uh, by myself and uh, Rongo. So we show that there's a cost polynomial time algorithm uh, under the same regime that we are going to show in this paper. And, uh, and if we um, have some slightly worse regime, right, n is less than d to the four thirds, uh, there's a very fast algorithm for decomposing this by Hopkins, uh, Schramm, Xi, and Starro. So, and, uh, and comparing to this paper, I mean, first of all, we tolerate more um, than, uh, higher n, and also we can tolerate more noise. So this paper doesn't really tolerate too much noise. Um, and uh, so this work, so we show that uh, under the regime when n is less than d to the 1.5 and the spectral norm noise of 1, we can decompose the tensor. Uh, sure. All. Uh, yes. Yes. If you compare to this, yes. And if you compare to this, we improve the running time from quasi polynomial to polynomial. Does the one point five depends on the uh, order of the tensor? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so if the order is higher, do you get something? Better? I think usually k over two. But uh, but for like for two for four tensor d square is um actually is uh, uh it's easier to get d square. Uh, for fourth order tensor, uh, and actually we also have um, have a, a sum of Schwarz algorithm for um, a so-called alg uh, algorithm called FUBI, which uh, works for fourth order tensor, and that algorithm is not uh, at least it doesn't it's not so robust noise, right? It's not uh, it's just probably inverse polynomial robust noise, and we can have uh, make it uh, more robust noise in the sum of Schwarz form. In some sense, we just have a new algorithm. Uh, in this, we have a um, we have a Ways to put the, his algorithm into some of squares framework so that uh, it's tolerate more noise. So in the, in the even dimension case, like four, mm -hmm. if you just flatten it uh -huh. to the two you know, mm -hmm. matrix, yes. don't you get the right decomposition? Uh, you get only the span because right. if you do spectral decomposition, it's a rotational invariant. So you can get the span of AI tensor two. You, you can get this. But uh, the question is, how do you find all this AI tensor two uh, in this span? So I mean, so the random it doesn't isolate. Uh, isolate. The composition will not give you uh, basis vectors for the. You know, that will be in general form. 
Just because there are um, there are a lot of bases, right? Oh, you get you, you get only get a span. span. You don't get an. Because uh, this this uh, if you have if for example if you have a big matrix M, which is equals to sum of A i tensor two A i tensor two transpose, right? So so in some so if you have some eigenvalues, right, then you can. I mean, figure them out um, in principle, but uh, but uh, if they are they all s with the same coefficient, then you can only get a span because there's a rotational environment. Sure, but mm. if, uh, but in the, okay, even in the random case. Even in the random case, yes. So, so and, and this full B algorithm basically what it does is that um, uh, there's some way to find uh, these vectors in the span. All right. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about the sum of squares algorithm. So let me introduce it uh, using the uh, Gomez, um, the max cut as an example. So so what SDV relaxation for like uh, this uh, case is that um, you introduce some auxiliary variable for x i x g, and uh, well, you, you have to explain what is oh and, uh, yeah, oh so it, it, it sorry yes it doesn't really matter what, what the formulation so uh, yeah right. so this is a uh, it's just uh, I always the matrix in the max cut case is a group group. Graph Laplacian, but let's say we are just um, maximizing some quadratic function, uh, quadratic polynomial, and with the constraint that x i square is equals to one. And uh, so this is a non-convex programming, and we want to introduce some auxiliary variable for x x j, uh, so that we can linearize everything. So now we can linearize the objective as a sum of i i j i i j i i j, and uh, and uh, we also can linearize the constraint. Right, i i i basically corresponds to x i square is equals to one. And we can have this PSD constraint, where i i j is a PSD matrix. And um, so, so then, so we can also try to extend this idea by introducing more auxiliary variable for all the other mo monomials, low degree monomials. For example, for x i x j x k, we can introduce one variable and i i j k l. So, and and we can try to put more constraint on these new variables, so and hope that uh, the relaxation is tighter and tighter. So, what constraints that we are allowed to write? For example, the first constraint we can do is that uh, if you view m i j k l this as a d square by d square matrix, um, this should be PSD. And uh, another type of constraint is that, for example, m i i i this is supposed to be x i to the four, so and we know that should be one, so we can put that to be one. And uh, it's so this kind of constraint is slightly um, non-usual. Uh, so the way to see it is that m i j k is supposed to be x i square x j x k. And x square is supposed to be one, so m i i j k is supposed to be x i x j, and which is also should be i m j k. So that's why you can safely put them to be to get to be the same because in a desired solution they are the same. So and so we can also have um, other kind of constraints, and you can see that it's get uh, quickly get uh, messier and messier because um, you don't even have a good way to describe in some sense describe these constraints. So we have we, we just have need, have to have a little bit. Uh, Kind of a different notation or different language to describe uh, this idea. So, and we introduce some. Um, we, uh, we basically we just change of notation. So now we call mij e tilde x x j. And so e tilde is a function that maps polynomial to to, to, to numbers to from monomials to numbers. And uh, so this is just a different notation. And we also linearize this uh, e tilde to uh, so that it, it maps uh, all the um, polynomial from degree low degree polynomial to real numbers. So it's a linear operator. And uh, and we call it a pseudo expectation if it sets for the following two constraints. So first of all, it's just a you know a scaling con con constraint. So you want to map uh, the constant polynomial one to one. And secondly, it's a non-negative. Um, there's there's so for every non-negative uh, for every squares of a uh, low degree polynomial, you should map it to um, a non-negative number. Right. So uh, so this constraint basically corresponds to a PSD constraint here. So I think the quick way to see it is that, um, for example, if you have a one degree one polynomial, which is equals to a transpose x, and uh, can, can you see it? So and uh, if you want uh, e tilde of g of x square is larger than zero, this basically means that uh, for every g with one degree one, this means that for every a e tilde, and you can write this as a transpose x x transpose a okay sorry i think this is a little bit redundant but and uh, this means that uh, for every a a transpose e tilde x x transpose 
uh, is larger than zero. So these are all kind of equivalent. Um, anyway, so so for every vector a, this should be larger than zero. This basically just means that, you know, uh, this e tilde of x has transpose should be PSD, and which is exactly this is exactly the matrix m i j that we are talking about. It's just a different ways to write it, different. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and <laughs> yeah, and and they have different names for it. I think they are all exactly the same. I mean, just this. So, um, so, it's a so, good name, no? expectation. Uh, yeah, I think okay. I think so. Okay. Yeah. So so now we are. Uh, yeah. No, I mean it, it's a, it's a good name for one thing. The, the fact that it sort of uh, should look like a distribution. And yeah. I mean, you never forget the definition once you see. Remember the name pseudo expectation. <laughs> the moment. Yeah, right. well, well, it depends what you're used to, but yeah. yeah. All right. People have uh, moments and monomials uh, in the different communities. <laughs> <laughs> Refer to different ones. OK, so, um, so now we are ready to, um, to do a kind of generic sample squares relaxation for any polynomial optimization problem. Uh, sort of. so, for so now, we, for, for example, suppose we want to maximize and constrain this at q i of x is 0. So then uh, what we can do is that um, we can optimize over all the pseudo expectations. And uh, the, the objective is to uh, maximize the expected uh, p of x. This is just. Um, the, 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 so there's just different ways of writing um, the old objective. And also, we have to take care of the constraint. So we are going to say that the uh, e tilde satisfies constraint q of x, which is equals to 0. I'm going to um, describe this in the next slide. So, uh, so the general idea is that for every, uh, polynomial time, uh, for, for every polynomial optimization problem, you can do this sum of squares relaxation. Uh, if you choose some degree d, and then you can do it. So let me explain what do I mean by e satisfies constraint q i of of x is 0. So the first part is just a, a definition. And here, um, so e tilde satisfies some constraint qx is 0. If and only if uh, for any polynomial r with reasonably low degree, so that the degree of q times r is less than d, uh, the pseudo expectation of uh, e tilde q of x, r of x is 0. So this is just uh, um, maybe it's good to show an example, simple example. So for example, if q of x it's just uh, x i square is minus 1 is, is this polynomial. Then, and if you take r of x, if you take r of x to be constant, then this constraint just says that uh, e tilde of q of x is e tilde x i square minus 1 is 0. This is just a different way of saying m i i is 1 in our previous example. Yes, because uh, constant uh, because it's linear operator. Yes, and uh, if uh, let's for example, if r of x is x j x k, right? So let's say take d is degree four. So this is still uh, low degree. So e tilde of q of x, r of x. This is just e tilde of x i square x j x k minus Let's use uh, linearity, xj, xk. So this is 0. It's just a different way of saying m i i j k is equals to m j k. Right. So, so this is just a, a, a succinct way of describing all the constraints that we can put um, on these relaxations. All right. So the key property that we're going to use here is that it's kind of just trivial from the definition. So if you have inequality a of x is, that is less than b of x, it's a, it's a polynomial inequality. Uh, and you can prove it by sum of squares uh, in the sense that uh, you can find the, GI, uh, the polynomial gi and the r so that this is true. Then, um, uh, then the, the pseudo expectation of ax is less than pseudo expectation of bx. So, and to see it uh, from the definition is kind of trivial because you can just take pseudo expectation on both the left hand side and right hand side. And uh, the pseudo expectation of this guy is going to be non active. The pseudo expectation of the third guy uh, is going to vanish because of this definition. 
And uh, so, so we get inequality. All right, so this is the probably the only property that we're going to use um, for this talk. Right. This, I mean, except the definitions. Well, I mean, it's the only thing you can use in this proof system. It's not the only thing. Right. So you're using everything you can use. Yes, yes, yes. So this is already, yeah, uh, everything, yes, of course, yes. So, um, uh, so just uh, mention that um, uh, the, the degree, so the runtime is going to be in exp um, n to the O of d. And so that's why we want to keep d to be constant so that it's a polynomial time algorithm. And so we can search over all the possible pseudo expectations that satisfy some constraints. All right. So let's see how to use uh, some of squash relaxations for tensor decomposition. So um, suppose um, we have, so let's ignore the error for now. So uh, it cer turns out that the right polynomial optimization uh, uh, program to write the following. There are only two constraints. There's no objective, even. So the first constraint is that uh, the, you can view the, the tensor as a multilinear form, and you plug in x and x and x. So uh, maybe it's good to write. So t of x, x, x is just the uh, sum of t i j x, x i x j x k. So basically, that just corresponds to this polynomial, this degree three polynomial. And uh, we write it to be larger than one minus epsilon. Uh, we make it, uh, we enforce it to be larger than one minus epsilon. So there was some normalization. Oh, yes, the second one. Yeah, normalization is that x needs to be 2 norm 1. But about the AI. Oh, yes. Uh, because they are unit. They, they are unit vectors. They are unit Yes. AI is a unit vectors. So uh, just uh, some sentence check, right? So, so every, OK, so the claim is that every feasible solution is close to one of AIs. Uh, we can do a sentence check. So let's plug in x to be AI. And then in the sum, we are going to have one entry 1. Right? And all the others are kind of 1 over square root d to the cube. And if you sum all of them, even in absolute value, so they are going to be small, like smaller than 1. Because they are, they are n terms, then the n is less than d to the 1.5, and each term is less than uh, d to the 1.5. Well, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um. Yeah. So each one of the AIs will satisfy yes. the uh, Yes. 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 Yes, so and there is a there is a simple like, uh, like if, so if there is a proof that shows that uh, this is this is the only way to, to make this constraint sets, uh, satisfiable. If you take uh, one over root two a one and one over root two. Right. Two. So okay, we, let's no, we can probably we can check that. So you it's random. Yeah. A, a random. So for example, let's take x to be one over root two times a one plus a two. Then th th this is this is not a proof, just the get some intuition. Cube, this is equals to, there are two terms, uh, which are something like uh, 1 over square root 2 uh, cube and plus rest. Right. And the rest of term are kind of random-like, because they, are, they have nothing to do with a1 and a2. So this rest is re really just equals to their n terms, and each term is 1 over square root d. Uh, to the cube. So I mean, this is a very generous upper bound, actually. So so now let's see. Okay, sorry. So let's see how large is this guy. So this is kind of negligible. This is O of one, and uh, so this is less than. And this is just uh, you know uh, this should be a number less than one. So it's just uh, two o square two. Right. So so any combinations will make it smaller. <coughs> Oh, oh no, sorry. Not the right. Op uh, this is one of the optimization problem that uh, that uh, not, not of the of the non-convex method that can solve this problem. And uh, right. So um, okay. So and let's do some of squash relaxation for it. This is a theorem, yeah. but it's it's a it's kind of a it's a known theorem. It's a yeah, yeah, so yes, yeah. yes. yes. Uh, uh, it's a um, uh, maybe it's good to say uh, just a few words about it. So you can prove that uh, uh, with pro with high probability soup uh, of some is less than one plus into one. I guess 
somehow I delete this from the slide to make it simpler. So this is the upper bound. And, and you can also show that the equality case is only really x equals to one of ai's. So, so, so basically, you just uh, look at the, the, in the in your proof uh, what is the kind of equality case, and you you find out you can find out that the x is, must be one of the a's. And this is kind of like an empirical process uh, statement because you are taking soup over some random guy, random variable. All right. So, but this is not so important for, for us. So we can, could, in some sense, believe it. Just so, and we, and in some sense, we are going to have uh, some of squares proof for it actually. So. So and uh, um, so we just do a pseudo exp uh, pseudo expectation. Uh, we just uh, do a sum of Schwarz relaxation, as we described in the previous slides. And so basically, we are looking for a pseudo expectation that satisfies the constraint one and two. All right. Okay. So uh, now let's see how to. Okay. The question is how do you uh, run this pseudo expectation to get the solution back? And uh, the proof overview. The proof consists of kind of two. It only, oh, it don't, yeah, right. It only returns at the moment. Are you going to the solution? Okay. What's the rounding problem? In our language, it only returns the pseudo expectation. Yeah. It's, so when the, the, the question is to, to get the, the AIs from the pseudo expectation, in, in some sense. So, which I'm going to, do, to talk about. Right. So, so, the proof overview is the, the following it consists of two steps. The first step is kind of like, um, this is actually proved uh, in um, a paper with Rongo. So, uh, so if you have this satisfied, if the pseudo expected satisfied this constraint, actually. So in particular, you could get the distribution over the AIs or something like that, right? Uh, it's not clear. It's not clear. This right. is a, a good solution. And that would be a good solution, yes. That would be the desired solution. I mean, that's the best you can hope, right? It's a mixture of, uh, uh, the pseudo expected is a mixture of the, 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 the AIs. Yes, I, I will talk more about it uh, in a few moments. Right. So, OK, so basically the first step uh, is basically just a sum of squares proof. You show that uh, this constraint implies this constraint. And uh, the magic here is actually that um, you know, um, somehow f for sum of squares, uh, three order tensor is not so different from six order tensor. Uh, because if you have, for example, six order tensor, sum of AI tensor to the tensor power six, and you do the same thing like we did before, then you are going to get the second constraint. right? So, but somehow, what? Sorry, again. So suppose you have uh, suppose you have access to this sensor, and uh, you oh, you might ma 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 maximize the the multilinear form over this tensor. This is a six order tensor. Then what you are going to get is something like this, yeah. right? But but now we we don't have that six order tensor. We only have three order tensor, but somehow we can still have the same constraint in, in the sum of squares framework. So some of squares don't, in some sense, don't distinguish these two even. Oh, I thought you were giving an explanation why that happened. You're, you're there. I'm, I'm not saying. I'm just uh, interpreting this, uh, this result. Yes, yes. So, so this is kind of like a, uh, like a, a good thing, um, because uh, somehow you automatically access higher order tensor. Remember, I mean, you call that in the, in the prior works, higher order tensor are usually relatively easier. So, uh, so this is um, a good thing for some of squares. And however, even if you are in the higher order case, it's still not clear how do you run uh, the solutions. Just to ask, mm. if you are going to show us the proof or not? This guy? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I, more than it's more than Cauchy Schwarz. What, yeah. what did you say? Uh, let, me, let, me, let me give you, I have a brief sketch, but I guess uh, because of the time, I can only give a sketch. Uh, OK. So what's a constant in the old? Uh, it's, a, it's a fixed constant, uh, like two or three. Uh, 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 yes, it's a reasonable one. Yes, right. So, um, and y y then I mean, if you get uh, this constraint, you are effectively accessing the six order tensor. What you can do is that you can take bi to be ei to the tensor power two and the y to be x to the tensor power two, and you get back to this uh, uh, the similar constraint. But the difference is that bi are actually d square dimensional vector. So now you are in the uh, the low run case, right? And it's less than d square. So that is supposed to be a simpler question. But however, you need to use the sum of squares. Uh, algorithm to solve it. So basically, the second part deals with um, the sum of squares algorithm to, to, to the wrong deal, so which is the, 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 the key uh, thing in this talk. 
So, but I guess um, let's um, talk a little bit about what's the, the first, um, how do we prove the first part? So, uh, I'm going to show it by, um, as a side product of uh, analyzing the integrality gap. Right, so, uh, so uh, what I described before is the constraint problem, right? There's only two constraints here, but actually you can move one constraint to the, to the, optimiza um, to the optimization. So let, this is just a like, small I mean, kind of thought experiment. So um, if we can put it uh, as a constraint, and, uh, and, and act, uh, actually as what I said here, so uh, if you have the integral solution, you know that it's less than one plus a rate of one. So the optimal solution that you care about is one plus a rate of one. And, uh, and here we are going to show that uh, this, this, uh, even doing after, after doing relaxation, the integrality gap is also one plus of one. So basically, that just, so we want to show that uh, the pseudo expectation is also less than one plus of one. And, and the, 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 the thing that you need to show is that actually this inequality is provable by sum of squares. Then you are done because you can safely take pseudo expectation over both sides. And um, right, so our goal is to just show inequality star by sum of squares. Uh, so I guess uh, let's, um, um, let's have a brief sketch for what kind of proof you want to uh, use to, for proving sum of squares. Yeah, what's the hypothesis here in this proof? There's no hypothesis, basically. Uh, AIs are random. Star, no, star. No, no, no hypothesis. Uh, x is a unit. Um, uh, x, x satisfies the constraint that x squared is equals to 1, and no other constraint. Uh, AIs, is AIs are random. So, so again, so what's the hypothesis? With high probability, With high probability over the randomness of AI? For every uh, for every x that for every pseudo distribution that satisfies x square is equals to one. So okay. So in this star, okay, let's say with high probability of AI, over AI, this inequality it can be proved by sum of squares modulo x square is equals to one. Make sense? Right. So okay. So x square is equals to one I mean, is assumed uh, throughout the talk. I think I forgot to mention it uh, at some point. Uh, all right. So so what are tools? So I think there are basically just two tools, I mean, or three. So the first one is cauchy schwarz The second one is that um, if you have this quadratic form x transpose bx, uh, you can bond it by uh, spectral norm b of b. So uh, and this, is a sum, this has a sum of squares proof. This is just a different way of saying that if you have a degree 2 polynomial, which is non-active at every point, then there is a sum of squares proof for its non-activity. So and uh, if you use tool number two, then you are going to uh, especially for the random kind of case, you're going to get a random matrix B. And the question is, uh, how do you bond uh, the spectral norm of it? And uh, so you need to use random matrix theory. So that's basically the, the tools that I know of for, for random case. Uh, so, so this is a little bit, uh, but uh, it's, it's not so hard. So, uh, so we care about the, the left-hand side. right? We raise it everything to power 2. And uh, the first step is just equality. So we rewrite it as the uh, inner product of two things, right? You just take one x out, and you leave everything else in the sum. And uh, so this, now it is an uh, inner product of two vectors. And uh, use cauchy schwarz Inner product of two vectors square is less than the, the square of the norm of the first one and the square of the norm of the second one. So this is cauchy schwarz And uh, this guy is going to be uh, 1, because this is our assumption. So now let's um, uh, expand the first one. Just um, expand it, expand the square. So uh, the cross term is going to be look like this. And uh, the term for i equals to j is going to be this, because ai has two norm one. So the exact detail doesn't don't match it too much. So the point here is that uh, so now we are going to try to use tool number two. Uh, of, but uh, the problem is that we have a, um, we have a polynomial of degree four. So, but uh, the number two only works for the polynomial of degree two, and uh, the, the the way to do it is that um, you know you just take uh, y to be x to the tensor power two, and then it's the degree two polynomial over y. However, the the, trick, the tricky thing is how do you change do this change of variable actually? But but for the first term, there's no nothing. Uh, you you just do it in a naive way, I mean in the most natural way. So um, actually, probably there's only one way. So and now it's a degree two polynomial over y, and it's y transpose a big matrix times y. And now you use tool number two, and uh, you bound it by, uh, we bound it by a spectral norm of this big matrix. And you use we use random matrix theory to bound the spectral norm. Uh, so this is by random matrix theory. And this, is, uh, no, this, this bound is, uh, it does not need to involve any polynomials. Because, um, so I mean, but, uh, yes, it doesn't need it's to. It's a degree two proof. It's a degree. 
four proof. Yeah. Degree, let's say six proof, actually. You need to raise it to four no, six. just the bottom one. The bottom one, yes, it's a degree four. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, and. You don't want to go to degree six, right? Why not? I mean, we, we want to, we, we're allowed constant degree. So that, that's. But that's uh, but, but still, degree four can give. For nominally, the, the proof can be of much higher degree. Yeah. It just uh, controls the running time. The degree of the proof is the, the, the running time. Okay. So for nominally, the proofing in a point before is degree three. So that's the. Yeah. It's like theory. Yeah. Yes. So, so this, so I think you get some flavor of what kind of proof you want to do. Uh, actually, uh, there are. Other caveat, for example, I cheated a little bit here. This matrix uh, is not exactly, I mean, so this week, bound of one, but our task is to prove one plus a little of one. So you need to do a little bit more to, to get it. And for the cross term, actually, how do you change the variable is also a question, because they are, it's kind of not that symmetric. So, and, but I think I'm going to skip that. It's just the technical details, right? So, so but just, uh, I guess, just believe me that uh, using similar tools with a little bit more, I mean, tricks, you can prove the first part to be pl 1 plus little of 1, and the second part to be little of 1. And so you get the integral gap. Um, you, so the, so, the, so the, sorry, the, the solution has, um, so you get this inequality, uh, this sum of uh, proof for this inequality. And as a sub product, if you look at this inequality, this shows that if the three power is large, then the fourth power is large, because the cross term is small. All right. So and uh, and uh, this also shows that uh, you can use similarly to. So if the first, th so just use this quantity without this bound. So if this is large, then the sum of these two are large, uh, is large, and so and this is small, so this needs to be large. Right. So similarly, we can prove that the the sixth power is large. All right. So so basically, we have proved the first part. Uh, I think I want to focus a little bit more on the, the second part, so, so let's skip the, most of the details of the first part. So, so I think the coolest thing in the second part is that, um, and OK, so let's see. So, so let's remind you, so the, in the second part, we, we are in this orthogonal case. So now we change everything to B and Y. They are in high dimension, and we are in orthogonal case. So and the proof, I mean, so I have this. Uh, with these slides for is a theorem, but uh, it's just saying that okay, if you satisfy this constraint, then this following this algorithm is going to work. And yes, yes, they are orthogonal. Orthogonal is, run, is stronger than random, yeah. right? So, so and uh, and so basically, you need to satisfy one constraint and another constraint, which I'm going to review later. This is the essential one. It's the, the key to to get this uh, kind of guarantees. But I think it only makes sense when I talk to into details. Uh, so, and, uh, OK, what's the rounding algorithm? So you evaluate this uh, matrix. This is a matrix with polynomial entries. And you take pseudo expectation uh, over all the entries. So this is a matrix. So the pseudo expectation of this guy is a real number, real matrix. And you take the top eigenvector. Oh, here, G is a random Gaussian vector. So. All right, let's maybe let me go, again, go over again. So let's take G to be random Gaussian. And we evaluate this matrix, the pseudo expectation of this matrix. And we take top eigenvector. And, uh, and then um, we can prove that the, the top eigenvector is going to be close to 1 of bi with, high pro with inverse poly probability. But I guess the exact detail doesn't matter too much. It's, so I think uh, I, I regret it uh, to put this slide, actually. But uh, so, so the, idea, so the, 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 the fact is that we can run this polynomial times to find 1 of the bi. And there are other known tricks to find all the other BS. And, uh, and BKS requires log n degree for this. And we can uh, do uh, of one degree. Can you say what the intuition? Oh, yes. I'm going to. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, I think uh, this is a kind of a. Um, so, so, OK. So I'm going to talk about intuitions. OK. Right. So, so I think the, the cool thing here is that uh, um, for this kind of problems, we have this paradigm for uh, designing running algorithms. This kind of new paradigm proposed uh, in the previous BKS paper. So, so it starts with this uh, very simple observation. So a rounding algorithm has to work for actual distribution, as um, the comments. So, um, so, so it has to work for, for actual distribution, which is a mixture of the desired solution. So this is the, the nicest things that you can encounter, right? The solution is just a mixture of the true solution, uh, the feasible solutions. And, uh, and also, it only access to pseudo expectation. 
So, so these are the limitations of our running algorithm, right? So, um, so but, uh, but this suggests that we can do this thought experiment, which is uh, a necessary thought experiment in some sense. And this is it's a strictly uh, simpler question that we probably want to first answer. So the thought experiment says that, let's assume just, uh, OK, we have actual distribution. It's just a real, real distribution instead of pseudo expectation. Uh, and this actual distribution is uh, a supported uh, it's supported on feasible solutions of the constraints. And, uh, and then let's design an algorithm for this case. This is a strictly simpler case. And let's prove the algorithm work. Right, so, and so this sounds like a strictly simpler task. But however, uh, usually, the beauty here is that usually, if you, uh, at least in this example, if you, and the, the key part is about this part. So, and after you have done with this thought experiment, you can. Uh, the real algorithm analysis is going to be like this. So instead of using a true distribution, you are going to use pseudo expectation. And uh, you are going to use the same algorithm, and, uh, and, but you replace the moment by the pseudo expectation. Oh, I guess I didn't mention that. The, the algorithm on the left hand side needs to only access the moments. It cannot uh, just draw some sample from the distribution, then it's, you are done, right? So you can only access the moments. So on the right hand side, you just replace the true moment of D by pseudo expectation. And the real analysis is just uh, you just replace whatever your proof here uh, by sum of squares proof. So, so although I mean, so basically you just need to uh, extend your sum of squares proofs to this case. You you, st uh, you send your argument with sum of squares proofs to the pseudo expectation world. Uh, th th usually, this proof uh, is not um, it's not going to be uh, sim uh, trivial. Uh, it's going to be a little bit uh, technical, but uh, it won't be something super hard. Because in some sense, like uh, you have already known that uh, something is true, and the only thing you need to do is to find the proof with only some. Of, only if you, only, you only need to find the sum of squares proof that shows it's true. So, uh, so usually it's relatively simple. Okay. So what I'm going to do in the next probably uh, 15 minutes is that I'm going to do the thought experiment for our problem, and uh, and I'm going to leave the sum of squares proof. To, um, I'm I'm not going to talk about sum of squares proof. So and you will see that the, the key difficulty is on the left hand side instead of the right uh, the, the right hand side. This part of that was suggested by, by David yes. And yes. Was yes, yes. In, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I'm not sure whether they, read, they wrote it in the paper, but uh, oh. certainly they talk about it in the talk. Uh, yeah, no, I think yeah. in the paper that was wrote for the ICM lecture. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Um, uh, so, so for our problem, so let's do the thought experiment. So we have a constraint, which is um, a sum of bi dot y cube is larger than 1 minus epsilon. So let's first examine what are the two feasible solutions. I mean, we have already done this again before. So all the feasible solutions are actually uh, one of the bi's plus a little bit noise, because we have some ar epsilon error here. So and, uh, and we assume that uh, uh, there's a for the thought experiment, we assume that we have a uniform. Oh, I said uniform, but OK. Let's say we have some distribution over the vectors b1 hat, hat to b n hat, which are close to b1, bi. And uh, so this is the setup of the thought experiment. Okay, let's have m so the question is how to design algorithm only access moments of d. So let's put uh, these two here. So, uh, so, the, so OK, so let's think about it. So you have a distribution, but you, only can, you can only have access to its moments. So the nat most natural thing to do is that you should uh, see what are the, mo are the moments, right? And so moment method comes again, actually. So let's look, look at uh, the third moment of this distribution, So which is uh, just this guy. So and, uh, this is a discrete distribution, right? It's only, it only has uh, n cases, right? It's just, uh, you know, it on so distribution only contains n cases, right? It can either be b1 height or b2 height up to b n height. Let's say pi is equals to the probability that uh, w is, is bi height. So pi, p is a probability vector. So, and, uh, so now we can write this easily, because uh, it's just the average of the n cases. It's pi that times bi height to the tensor power 3. And, and bi height is close to bi, so it'd be easy. we can also view it as this. right? It's, a, it's the, this true moment of bi times some noise vector, noise tensor. All right, so just uh, some small facts about uh, this moment. So, so first of all, the tensor could be, uh, could, uh, could be relatively, so the noise tensor could be relatively large. 
uh, could be as large as O of epsilon, as you can imagine, because um, B i hat and B i are kind of epsilon uh, far away with each other. So, yes. So, yeah. So let me be very clear. So, for example, you can think of it as uh, you flatten it and uh, you measure. So. So it's not exactly uh, important for, for which norm it is measured. So let's say even in the, in the best norm that you, you care, so it, it is still could be le less something like of epsilon. So and, um, and, uh, another uh, small fact is that, uh, let's say suppose P1 is 1. So, so basically, this solution is only supported on one vector. So it's really an integral solution in our uh, usual sense. So um, in this case, we should be easier, right? It should be easier because m is just uh, b1 to the 10th of 3 plus uh, epsilon noise. And now we can do kind of whatever we want. Where we, for example, we can flatten it and uh, make it the matrix, and uh, we can do singular vector decomposition. We are going to get b1. So, so this is the easy case. Right, so, so this suggests that maybe the hard case is that bi are all uh, 1 over n, right? They are all this really uniform distribution over the n feasible solutions. OK. All right, so, uh, so we, we are trying to find bi from the moment. right? This is the, the main question. You are trying to find one bi. One, only one of them, yes. So let's try to use this uh, Lorgan's algorithm again. So Lorgan's algorithm was the algorithm to, for, all, for orthogonal tensor decomposition, although it doesn't tolerate noise. So, but let's try to use it. So we take a random Gaussian g, and then we take a, a a con contraction of this t uh, tensor uh, using G. So this notation mg dot dot, this is just saying that uh, you view the tensor as a 3D array, and you average the slices using vector G. Using the <coughs> so, and, uh, the, the, so basically, it's just uh, this matrix. So w dot G times w w transpose. It's a weighted covariance matrix. And uh, we can, similarly, we can write it as this, <coughs> because it, so um, let's uh, do another easy case, just to build up some intuition. So suppose n is 0, there's no noise, and bi hat is equal to bi. So then this is the, uh, this is the good case, because you know, uh, the, the matrix that we evaluated is just, just um, so bi's are just the uh, eigenvectors of this matrix, because they're all orthogonal, and uh, it's just a sum of bi, bi transpose. So, so and, uh, and you know, this half i is, um, is a is a random is a random variable and with probability one they are distinct uh, if pi are not uh, zero, so so you have a matrix with di distinct eigenvectors and the eigenvectors are the pi, so we are done. So exactly almost uh, uh, what Rogers algorithm did for orthogonal case. So however the problem is that this is not inverse poly, and this is only inverse poly robust noise. It's not uh, it doesn't tolerate like absolute noise, and. Uh, this doesn't tolerate noise because we are in the. We assume that the n is zero. Oh. oh, I see. Because you know, if you want to tolerate noise, you need to uh, make sure the noise is smaller than the eigengap. If you do like a angular decomposition, an eigengap it could be very small. It could be one over n or even smaller, Pro probably. Probably one over n. I think is a good estimate for the eigengap. So, so if you want to make this work, I think you need one over n um, error. Uh, but but we are trying to handling but epsilon. You know nothing about n except for its. Uh, you, nothing about any of Yes. But maybe you don't know more. Yes. So uh, actually, we can enforce more. So let's see. Oh, that's what we can. So this is the cool part of this uh, this thing. So, sorry, what happened? I think. Uh, okay. Okay. Good. So okay, this is next slide. So so now we have a revised idea to use the Lorgan's algorithm. So let's say we are in the in the, in the hard case. Let's say all the PIs are one over n. And uh, so, so we just get pi out of this sum. So, um, so this bi hat dot g, this is a random variable. This is a Gaussian random variable with standard deviation 1. So with inverse poly chance, one of the, them, let's say b1, is going to be relatively large than uh, third sex one constant times a large constant times the square root log n times the standard deviation. And all the others are going to be small, uh, smaller than some constant times uh, square root log n. So this is going to happen uh, with one inverse poly chance. That's good. So and if this happens, let's see. So suppose this happens, then um, we can separate the sum into two parts, right? The, the part about only about b1 hat and the part about the rest. 
And uh, so this part is a rank one matrix. And the, eigen, it's, uh, the eigenvalue is larger than 30 times square root log n over n. Right. So and, the, and the what happens in the next part? We hope that the, the, the spectral norm of the second part is even smaller than just the eigenvalue of the first part. So that we can do eigen decomposition. Uh, we, can do, we can take the top eigenvector. So, um, so, and, and, uh, so let's try to estimate the spectral norm. So first of all, these are PSD matrix. So we can safely I mean, increase this to the, the largest. Um, if you increase this number, then it's going to be at, at least larger in spectral norm. So, so basically, we bound uh, all these guys by the maximum. And, uh, and we get the sum of bi bi hat at the end. So this is something like 3 times square root log n here. And, uh, and this guy, let's see. So suppose they are almost orthogonal, then it's 1. Then we, uh, then we are done, right? Because so suppose this, this uh, calculation can work, uh, then we are done, because uh, the rest of the part has spectral norm only 3 times square root log n over n. So we can do just eigen decompositions over this matrix, and uh, we can take the top eigenvector, and that is going to be close to B1. However, I'm cheating here, because B i hat are not orth uh, orthogonal with each other anymore. And that's exactly what we, I mean, the, the problem that we had before, right? You know, like, uh, so B i hat could be only absolute, could be absolute away from B i, and, uh, and, uh, and the, the errors could accumulate. So OK, maybe, oh, yes. So B i orthogonal doesn't mean that B i hat orthogonal. So, so the errors could uh, be on the same direction, and they could accumulate, so that uh, the errors could be as large as n to the n times epsilon. Where, where did this epsilon come from? This so, uh, bi hat is close to bi. Oh, where epsilon comes from? So, uh, in, the, in our constraint, we have this epsilon. So, oh, it's that same epsilon. Yes. So this epsilon is going to I mean, this epsilon is going to be the same epsilon as bi hat is close to bi. So there's another one coming from the fact that the AIs are random and so the bi's, even though they're almost also random, yes. they're not also Yes. Yes, that epsilon is... Uh, the bi's themselves are not Yes, also. yes. That epsilon is uh, sm smaller than this. Smaller it's uh, than it's a, 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 yes, it's, it's a even lower order term. So I'm, I'm hiding that, uh, um, yes. Right, so the, 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 the true analysis is going to be that uh, you need to also do an orthogonalization of um, bi to make them really orthogonal and then run this argument. So, but I'm hiding that the detail. So, so this is the, the key uh, problem and the key question we want to address. So um, however, as uh, Sanjeev uh, mentioned, so, um, so somehow, uh, th th so this is a kind of like a pessimistic because um, bi height, so you, you should ex expect that the, the error should um, uh, point to different directions so that um, they are going to cancel it or they are going to just, so the spectral norm won't accumulate, right? The error shouldn't accumulate. So, and, uh, so the idea is that we just add constraint that enforce B hat to be isotopic. Uh, there's a, a slight warning which doesn't apply to our case. So the warning is that you cannot really always add constraint. You can only add uh, constraint on pseudo moments. But the good thing is that here, because we, we, we've done this uh, revised uh, logarithm algorithm, we are just uh, really, so this, the, the operator we care is just the two moments of d. So we can safely add a constraint on it. So, 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 the, so the, the, the lemma is going to be like this. So we add this constraint. OK, so OK, let me parse it uh, slowly. So, so this is the same condition that we are in in this, the whole section uh, here. So, D is uh, supported on some um, on, on bi height that is close to bi, and we are going to enforce this constraint, which says that um, the, the two moment of D has small spectral norm, right? And uh, suppose you uh, have this uh, constraint, additional constraint, then we can prove that the algorithm that we are discussing um, is going to be good. So the top eigenvector is going to be close to b1. So, so basically, the only change is that we add this constraint that you enforce it. Um, why is there a feasible solution? Why is a feasible Yes. Uh, so um, because the uniform distribution over bi is going to, be a uni going to be a feasible solution over the true bi. If they are all orthogonal. If they are all orthogonal. Yes. 
So OK, so let me uh, try to I mean, parse, I mean, further discuss this a little bit more. So what are the pseudo moments? Right? The pseudo moments is a uh, weighted sum of bi, bi hat transpose, bi, bi hat, bi hat transpose. So then this constraint is just a saying that you know, all the PIs need to be 1 over n, actually. Because you know, if you have uh, some PI that is larger than 1 over n, then certainly this guy has an eigenvalue. I mean, because you can just plug in bi hat, and the eigenvalue is going to be larger than 1 over n. So this constraint is just saying that all the PIs need to really 1 over n exactly. Um, although I mean, I mean, in, in, the, in the true I mean, the theorem, you need to put a little bit constant here just to make it. You need to have a little bit of flexibility, but but let's ignore that issue. So the PI I really just need to be in a hard case. So in some sense, like we are enforcing ourselves uh, to the hard case instead of the easy case. Where right? the easy case are the, in the integral solution case when one of the PI is large and uh, all the others are zero. So why we so in retrospect, in retrospect, why I wanted to do this? The reason is that uh, if you plug in pi is equals to one over n into this uh, equation here, what you are going to get is that the sum of bi hat bi hat transpose is going to be less than one over n, and this two one over n cancel out. So what we get is the, the desired condition we want to put. Okay, so what's the condition that you put? Yeah, I guess you have so the condition, that, the formal condition that we are going to put is this guy. So and uh, in this uh, salt experiment, it translates to you know sum of bi bi hat transpose has also I mean, bi also topic so 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 the idea here actually is that uh, although we are we force ourselves in a hard case a funny thing right so you, normally in convex relaxation you try very hard to to make an inquiry to make it sort of uh, focus on one solution yes and here you say go with the average yes you, you have to and uh, the reason is that uh, Actually, you don't really want average. The reason is that you want to enforce noise to spread out. To, 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 to make the sure the noise spread out in the whole space. So you enforce the, the, the solution. So, so you enforce, you, you enforce the uniform solution is not our real goal. Uh, and the real goal is to enforcing, is to enforce that the, the noise is kind of uniform over the whole space. And, uh, and the side product is that you enforce yourself to be the, to the hard case. So why does it enforce that and that is so? Uh, why is the second line? Oh, right. So, um, you know, uh, say sum of pi. Yeah, hat. So this guy always has, uh, so if you plug in bi hat, it will evaluate the correct form, this guy. I mean, if they are kind of orthogonal, then this is going to be pi. Right. So, so in some sense, like uh, if if pi is larger than one over n, then you you are not going to satisfy this constraint. So this says that uh, the spectral norm of pi, pi hat, pi hat, should be larger than any pi, any pj. So on the, on the other hand, you want, you want, to, want it to be smaller than 1 over n, so each pi needs to be one, less than 1 over n. Sorry. Right, so, so, so the, the main point is that uh, in this matrix, there is uh, there's some noise in it. And you, by enforcing that it is less than uh, one over n, you also enforce noise to be less than one over n. And that's the main point. Right. So I think uh, let me just spend uh, a few minutes to describe what, or what, what, what we are going to do when we are try to do, do it for pseudo expectation. I'm not going to prove anything, but just uh, show a correspondence. So, so this, is the, this is the lemma that uh, the below is the lemma that we proved for actual distribution. And uh, so we need to, in some sense, we just need to um, translate every state, every line of this lemma into uh, a statement about pseudo expectation. So for example, the, 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 the assumption, right, these supported on points that are close to B, B1 to Bn, this is going to be, um, this sentence is going to correspond to, uh, is going to correspond to uh, pseudo expectation satisfies sum of Bi dot Y cube is larger than one mass. You can think of this as a kind of analytical 
uh, surrogate for, for this assumption. And, uh, and the second one, this is going to just translate to, you know, you just replace expectation by pseudo expectation. And, uh, and uh, the statement is just also, so we just replace expectation by pseudo expectation. We get the same statement. So, so this is what we are going to do. We, we need to do. Uh, we need to show that uh, this correspondence can work out by some of, by some of squares proof. But I guess I'm not going to um, talk about how to really do it. And there are some technical details to make it work. And what is your uh, what, uh, uh. So in the, in the actual proof, not the sum of square proof, mm. you just use the, again uh, some random matrix analysis of random. Um. Uh, I think there are uh, several things because, um, uh, right, so for example, you need to. It's yeah, right. this calculation about alpha, about, uh, you know, that, that's. Right, that's fine. That's, that's, uh, fine. that's fine. Yeah. So I think the part, okay, maybe it's good to go back and see. So this is the kind of the proof of this lemma. So this inequality, this guy is less than this guy. This is not uh, really a sum of scores. But, but it's almost, because, um, um, but the, the problem is that uh, here, uh, what you do is that um, in some sense, like uh, you are conditioning on this event and then prove the statement. And then the conditioning on some event is also not uh, sum of scores proof. So, so in some sense, you have to, right, be, because, because in sum of scores, you cannot condition on some event, right? It's, it's, they are all form of variables, just. So BI, is, so, so that's the, the problem. And uh, right. And also, this inequality, you need to have a sum square proof for it. Um, let's see. Yes. And, and actually, uh, an interesting thing is that uh, to prove this inequality with I mean, the whole inequality, so I guess the, maybe let me write that down. Oops. Uh, So there's one statement, which is that uh, the probability over G um, let's say, so what we are going to prove? We are going to prove that uh, W G pseudo expectation G W W transpose. So this, this has top eigenvector. So bi close to bi is larger than inverse poly. So this is kind of the statement we want to prove. And, um, and in some sense, you can, this is kind of equivalent to probability over g. Um, let's uh, factorize out the, the component for bi. So, so basically, it's just saying that uh, this matrix, uh, the pseudo expectation of this matrix, um, so let's okay. Let's see. So let's project it, this matrix to the component that is orthog the, the subspace that is orthogonal to bi. This is a projection to the yeah to that subspace of this pseudo expect this is pseudo expectation this guy, and uh, so this matrix has spectral norm less than something. This event needs to be larger than inverse poly. Actually, this event is actually even larger than one over inverse poly. It's a high probability event. So, so if the this guy has a um, kind of very small con contribution in the direction of uh, um, in the direction that is orthogonal to bi, and it has good contribution in the direction that is uh, the direction of bi, then we are done. So, so basically, this is the statement that we need to prove. And uh, so, and we prove it. So, and the the way that we prove it for for true this uh, dis, uh, distribution is something like you need to do a conditioning on what ha this event ha is happens. So, and that is not really allowed uh, in here. So, and uh, so we do some kind of matrix concentration kind of stuff. Yeah, the, the, the usual proof is matrix concentration. The, I mean the not Um, a matrix, uh, mm, but 
but I think the, the, the easiest proof is this, this, which doesn't use some, which use the matrix concentration at, at the end, like uh, here. Oh. So you do a lot of operations, and then you use matrix concentration. And, uh, and you need to do it um, like, a, like in a whole. And actually, I think uh, at the beginning, we also introduced uh, another constraint so that we can make this work. So another constraint on the pseudo expectation so that the matrix concentration can work. And, uh, and finally, we realized that uh, that constraint is, is not useful. So. All right, so I guess I should stop soon. So, uh, so this, is the, this is my last slide, I guess. OK, so we have done with the second part. So just um, a little bit of summarization, uh, summary. So we proved that for n is d to the 1.5, and all of one uh, spectral norm noise, uh, we can decompose three other tensor. And there are some other results in this paper. Uh, we can also reproduce the guarantees of BKS in polynomial time. So BKS has a quasi polynomial time for high order tensor decomposition. And in the same uh, setting, we can do a polynomial time algorithm using almost the same idea. And also, we have uh, another false order tensor decomposition, which doesn't require, um, doesn't require random assumptions. It only requires some kind of non-degenerate non assumptions. So, Right, so I guess um, one direct open question is that um, how do we do robust three order tensor without the random, uh, randomness assumption? You need something because of the right, you need something. For example, so for fourth order tensor, if there's no noise, there's, um, you only need some algebraic uh, uh, condition. Like uh, if something doesn't happen, then we're good. And it's kind of a linearly independent assumption uh, for some, some lifting of the AIs. And so, so, so it's like a, like a generically, uh, you can decompose three other ten, false other tensor. Although it, uh, the old algorithm was not robust to noise, and we make it uh, robust to noise. And for three other tensor, we didn't even know how to do it uh, without noise. 